In this edition of Back in History, we narrate the events that took place in August 1985 when the military government of Major General Muhammadu Buhari was overthrown by the same set of military officers who assisted him to power. Buhari's life was spared, so were the lives of the people around him. The coup was the sixth military coup in the post-independence history of Nigeria. Welcome to this edition of Back in History. One significant truth about military coup is the fact that it is usually difficult to plan and execute them without the participation of others. Thus, the military coup of 1983, which removed civilian president Shehu Shegari from power and enthroned Major General Muhammadu Buhari as a new head of state, was planned and executed with the aid of several senior and middle-level military officers. Ibrahim Badaba Sibabangida was in it. Sania Bacha was in it. In fact, it was Sania Bacha who made the first national broadcast announcing the overthrow of Shehu Shegari. Sambo Dasuki and others were also in the coup. And for the coup plotters, Muhammadu Buhari was the right person for the position of head of the military government, while Tunde Idiabon, a Yoruba Muslim, was the right person to be appointed as the deputy head of state. Buhari gave a few of the coup plotters sensitive positions in his government, while many others were not rewarded with any position. It is reported that there were many complaints of hardship and high-handedness in the country during Buhari's military rule. Prices of commodities in the market had escalated and the cost of living was painfully high at all levels in the country. The economic policies of the regime were biting so hard on the people. Importation of many items were prohibited and several companies were unable to produce optimally anymore and other companies were forced by the economic reality of the time to shut down. The cost of living was becoming unbearable in the country. It appears that the military officers who assisted Buhari to power were not happy with the situation and thus began to scheme in the most clandestine manner to overthrow the regime and form a new government to administer the affairs of the country. For instance, on taking over from Buhari, Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida in his maiden speech gave reasons for the overthrow and one of his reasons was, I quote, that Buhari had failed to deal with the country's economic problems. The coup would have been struck earlier, but it is reported that the coup planners were afraid of Tunde Idiabon, who was Buhari's deputy. Tunde was a no-nonsense officer. He was ruthless and gave no room for compromise. The fear of Tunde Idiabon was the beginning of wisdom for the coup plotters. For this reason, they decided to keep watch on Tunde Idiabon to know the most convenient time to strike, perhaps in his absence. It then occurred that Tunde Idiabon left to Saudi Arabia for Hajj. While there, the coup plotter struck and removed Buhari from power. Buhari was arrested and taken to Benin City where he was kept in confinement in a well-guarded bungalow for three years. This coup was well planned, principally among senior officers and other officers of the middle cadre who were able to keep the the coup plan secret and strictly confidential. Immediately after the overthrow and arrest of Buhari, Brigadier Joshua Dogonyaru was assigned to make an initial broadcast to the nation. He went on A and announced as follows, and I quote, I, Brigadier Joshua Ninyel Dogonyaru, of the Nigerian army, 
hereby make the following declaration on behalf of my colleagues and members of the Nigerian Armed Forces. Fellow countrymen, the intervention of the military at the end of 1983 was welcomed by the nation with unprecedented enthusiasm. Nigerians were unified in accepting the intervention and looked forward, hopefully, to progressive changes for the better. Almost two years later, it has become clear that the fulfillment of expectations is not forthcoming. Because this generation of Nigerians and indeed future generations have no other country but Nigeria, we could not stay passive and watch a small group of individuals misuse power to the detriment of our national aspirations and interests. No nation can ever achieve meaningful strides in its development where there is an absence of cohesion in the hierarchy of government. Where it has become clear that positive action by the policymakers is hindered because, as a body, it lacks a unity of purpose. It is evident that the nation would be endangered with the risk of continuous misdirection. We are presently confronted with that danger. In such a situation, if action can be taken to arrest further damage, it should be taken and must be taken. This is precisely what we have done. The Nigerian public has been made to believe that the slow pace of action of the federal government headed by Major General Muhammad Buhari was due to the enormity of the problems left by the last civilian administration. The concept of collective leadership has been substituted by stubborn and ill-advised unilateral actions, thereby destroying the principles upon which the government came to power. Any effort made to advise the leadership met with stubborn resistance and was viewed as a challenge to authority or disloyalty. Thus, the scene was being set for systematic elimination of what was termed oppositions. All the energies of the rulership were directed at this imaginary opposition rather than to effective leadership. The result of this misdirected effort is now very evident in the country as a whole. The government has started to drift. The nation's meager resources are once again being wasted on unproductive ventures. Government has distanced itself from the people and the yearnings and aspirations of the people as constantly reflected in the media have been ignored. Furthermore, the initial objectives and programs of action which were meant to have been implemented since the ascension to power of the Buhari administration in January 1984 have been betrayed and discarded. The present state of uncertainty and stagnation cannot be permitted to degenerate into suppression and retrogression. We feel duty-bound to use the resources and means at our disposal to restore hope in the minds of Nigerians and renew their aspirations for a better future. We are no prophets of doom for our beloved country, Nigeria. We therefore count on everyone's cooperation and assistance. All seaports and airports are closed. All borders remain closed. A dust to dawn coffee is hereby imposed in Lagos and all state capitals until further notice. All military commanders will ensure effective maintenance of law and order. Further announcements will be made in due course. God bless Nigeria. Unquote. This announcement by Joshua Dogonyaru did not mention the name of Buhari's successor. Nigerians thus waited for another announcement to know the direction the country was heading. Nigerians waited for a long time time 
for the much anticipated second broadcast. Dogonyaro's broadcast was made at about 6 a.m. of the cool date. Immediately after the broadcast, the inner caucus of the cool plotters held a meeting at Bonny Camp to discuss on urgent issues, including the appointment of new set of leaders for Nigeria. The following officers were present at the meeting. Major General Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida, Brigadier Sani Abacha, Brigadier Joshua Dogunyaru, Brigadier Aliyu Muhammad, Navy Commodore Mutala Nyako, Lieutenant Colonel Ahmed Abdullahi, Lieutenant Colonel Tanko Ayuba, Colonel John Shagaya, Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Ukbu from Cross River State, Major Buba Kauma, and a few others. Decisions were taken at the meeting, which lasted for several hours, and Brigadier Sanea Bacha was saddled with the responsibility of announcing the decisions to the public through a radio broadcast. At about 3.30 p.m., the familiar voice of Brigadier Sanea Bacha was heard on national radio. He came on A to announce the appointment of Major General Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida as the new head of state and commander-in-chief of the armed forces of Nigeria. He announced the Navy Commodore Bitu Ukiwe, the then flag officer commanding Western Naval Command, as the second in command to Babangida. Abacha had gained popularity for cool speeches and participation in coups. It was Abacha who announced to the world the news of the overthrow of Shehu Shagari and the selection of Muhammadu Buhari as the new head of state. He also announced the removal of Muhammadu Buhari from power. Abacha would later make other coup announcements in the coming years, including announcing himself as the military head of state after the removal of Ernest Shenekon. Following Abacha's announcement, the next anticipated speech was a speech of the new man, Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida. Babangida went on air and made the following speech. Unquote, Fellow Nigerians, when in December 1983, the former military leadership, headed by Major General Muhammad Buhari, assumed the reins of government, its accession was heralded in the history of this country. With the nation at the mercy of political misdirection and on the brink of economic collapse, a new sense of hope was created in the minds of every Nigerian. Since January 1984, however, we have witnessed a systematic denigration of that hope. It was stated then that mismanagement of political leadership and a general deterioration in the standard of living which had subjected the common man to intolerable suffering were the reasons for the intervention. Nigerians have since then been under a regime that continued with those trends. Events today indicate that most of the reasons which justified the military takeover of government from the civilians still persist. The initial objectives were betrayed and fundamental changes do not appear on the horizon. Because the present state of uncertainty, suppression, and stagnation resulted from the perpetration of a small group, the Nigerian Armed Forces could not, as a part of that government, be unfairly committed to take responsibility for failure. Our dedication to the cause of ensuring that our nation remains a united entity, worthy of respect and capable of functioning as a, vi a viable and credible part of the international community dictated the need 
to arrest the situation. Let me at this point attempt to make you understand the premise upon which it became necessary to change the leadership. The principles of discussions, consultation, and cooperation which should have guided decision-making process of the Supreme Military Council and the Federal Executive Council were disregarded soon after the government of Buhari settled down in 1984. Regrettably, it turned out that Major General Muhammadu Buhari was too rigid and uncompromising in his attitudes to issues of national significance. Efforts to make him understand that a diverse polity like Nigeria required recognition and appreciation of differences in both culture and individual perceptions only served to aggravate these attitudes. Major General Tunde Idiabon was similarly inclined in that respect. As Chief of Staff, Supreme Headquarters, he failed to exhibit the appropriate disposition demanded by his position. He arrogated to himself absolute knowledge of problems and solutions and acted in accordance with what was convenient to him using the machinery of government as his tool. A combination of these characteristics in the two most important persons holding the nation's vital offices became impossible to contend with. The situation was made worse by a number of other government functionaries and organizations, chief among which is the Nigerian Security Organization. In fact, this body will be overhauled and reorganized. And so it came to be that the same government which received the tumultuous welcome now became alienated from the people. To prevent a complete erosion of our given mandate, therefore, we had to act so that hope may be rebelled. Let me now address your attention to the major issues that confront us so that we may, as one people, chart a future direction for our dear country. We do not pretend to have all the answers to the questions which our present problems have put before our nation. We have come with the strongest determination to create an atmosphere in which positive efforts shall be given the necessary support for lasting solutions. For matters of the moment which require immediate resolutions, we intend to pursue a determined program of action. Major issues falling into this category have been identified and decisions taken on what should be done. Firstly, the issue of political detainees or convicts of special military tribunals. The history of our nation had never recorded the degree of indiscipline and corruption as in the period between 1979 and December 1983. While this government recognizes the bitterness created by the irresponsible excesses of the politicians, we consider it unfortunate that methods of such nature as to cause more bitterness were applied to deal with past misdeeds. We must never allow ourselves to lose our sense of natural justice. The innocent cannot suffer the crimes of the guilty. The guilty should be punished only as a lesson for the future. In line with this government's intention to uphold fundamental human rights, the issue of detainees will be looked into with dispatch. As we do not intend to lead a country where individuals are under the fear of expressing themselves, the Public Officers Protection Against False Accusation Decree No. 4 of 1984 is hereby repealed. And finally, those who have been in detention under this decree are hereby unconditionally released. The responsibility of the media to disseminate information shall be exercised without undue hindrance. In that process, those responsible are expected to be forthright and to have the nation's interest as their primary consideration. 
the last 20 months have not witnessed any significant changes in the national economy. Contrary to expectations, we have so far been subjected to a steady deterioration in the general standard of living and intolerable suffering by the ordinary Nigerians have risen higher. Scarcity of commodities has increased, hospitals still remain mere consulting clinics, while educational institutions are on the brink of decay. Unemployment has stretched to critical dimensions. The present situation whereby 44% of our revenue earning is utilized to service debts is not realistic. To protect the danger this poses to the poor and the needy in our society, steps will be taken to ensure a comprehensive strategy of economic reforms. Fellow Nigerians, this country has had since independence a history mixed with turbulence and fortune. We have witnessed our rise to greatness, followed with a decline to the state of a bewildered nation. Let me reiterate what we said in 1984. The generation of Nigerians and indeed future generations have no other country but Nigeria. We must all stay and salvage it together. This time, it shall be pursued with deeper commitment and genuine sincerity. There is a lot of work to be done by every single Nigerian. Let us all dedicate ourselves to the cause of building a strong, united and viable nation for the sake of our own lives and the benefit of posterity. Finally, I wish to commend the members of the armed forces and the Nigerian police for their mature conduct during the change. I thank you all for your cooperation and understanding. God bless Nigeria. Babangida then commenced the running of the country. He appointed military governors and also created states. He was so amiable at the start of his administration and was loved by many. He immediately released several persons who were detained by Buhari's admi military administration and promised to take the country into the path of prosperity. He also took measures aimed at having a better economy for Nigeria. He embarked on massive construction of public utilities, such as the Third Mainland Bridge in Lagos, Aso Rock in Abuja, and several others. He also created states. Unlike his predecessor in office, Babangida was very friendly with the press and regularly held media chats with journalists. He was a well-loved military head of state until his popularity began to wane. Firstly, as a result of his long grip to power and postponement of debt for handover to civilian administration, the human rights record of his administration also dropped at home and internationally. Babangida could have been killed in Gideon Oka school in 1990, but he was served by the effort of his ADC UK Bello and his closest ally in military uniform, Brigadier Sani Abacha, who braved the odds and repelled the coup plotters. Babangida's life was spared. His family was also spared. The coup attempts failed, and Babangida still remained in power for another couple of years. Babangida ruled for eight years as military head of state and had no option than to step aside in 1993 following the heat that greeted him after the annulment of the June 12 election. Babangida handed over the reins of power to N.S. Shenekon as interim head of state and gave him a mandate to organize election and transit Nigeria to civilian administration. The administration of N.S. Shenakan did not last for up to 100 days. N.S. could hardly be recognized by the armed forces of Nigeria as their commander-in-chief. N.S. was overthrown in a military coup led by Sani Abacha. Babangida had since retired from the military and from public outings and engagements. He lives in his palatial home in the city of Mina 
in Niger state of Nigeria. Babangida was married to his friend Maria Mokogu, who was from Asaba in Delta State. Following their marriage, she took the name Maria Babangida, and their marriage was blessed with four children. Thanks for watching this episode of Back in History, and do remember to subscribe to the channel for regular notifications. <music>